Hey guys, Thing Fishy here, and welcome to patch 1.10. 1.10 is a very small update, and it's almost exclusively PvP based. But one major change to PvE was that critical attacks have been buffed massively. So to test this, my first thought was making another parry build. But I've done that quite a bit on this channel. So to make it more interesting for the non-parryable enemies, I thought I'd pair my parry build with the most ludicrous posture breaking build that I've ever made on this channel. The Wing of Astal Nebula build for a monstrous two-in-one weapon swapping crit build. If you fancy doing a pure parry build to check out the new crit buff, this one that I did a while ago is now much stronger than it once was. To get set up, I followed my standard setup guide, link to the full video and play along in the description. You need both the smithings and the sombers for this one. We pick up the action at the Grace by EG. Drop down the cliff and head along the wall to reach the Int tier. Now to the Ball Prawn Shack and south into the village of the Albanorix to farm some mushrooms. All the ones around the Grace respawn, so rest and grab them a couple of times. Another good way of getting a bunch is visiting Bok in Limgrey. He'll give you 10 on your first meeting. Now to the third church of Marika and ride south to the minor earth tree. We want a whole bunch of tarnished golden sunflowers. So grab all the ones around the tree and you can respawn them by quitting out. I did this a couple of times. Next to Kale in the church of Ella for the crack pots, the crafting kit, and the missionary's cookbook. Then to the minor earth tree in northwest Kalid, past the tree avatar, and out onto this branch for another cracked pot. Head to the Church of the Plague in Kalid and make it night. So to get the wing as early as possible, we're gonna fight Radan first. And to do that, we need a strong weapon. So why not go for the most busted one in the game? Ride south from the church and up onto this mound. Craft some holy pots, line up the death bird with your character's waist and start chucking pots. When you run out, jump on Torrent and go to this section of the mound that overlooks Radan's arena. You'll lose aggro here and can craft more pots. Rinse and repeat until the bird is dead and we have the Death's Poker. Time for some runes. Now it's undeniable that the Knight's Cavalry is harder a cheese than he once was. So here's an alternative method if you're getting frustrated with the traditional one. Head to the other side of the bridge, use a bow to aim and chuck Kukri's in these three spots as he approaches. Now to Fort Farrath to kill Grail with the Morning Star and the Bleak Grease, popping a foul foot just as she dies. When you level up, don't bother with the 20 strength I just gave myself. It was for the jellyfish shield, before I realised that that was an idiotic idea and the jellyfish shield really wouldn't work well for this build. Go for some extra vigour or in instead. As I'm sick of looking at the starting armour, I went to see an old friend for the leather armour. Now head to the minor ur tree in North Leonia to bully the avatar for the magic shrouding tier. Time for Radan. From the Church of the Plague, ride through the graveyard and jump off this cliff, delaying the second jump as long as possible. I'm using this fun little skip as a good opportunity to tell you that no glitches or skips were patched in 1.10. So everything that we've used in previous guides still works absolutely fine. Fighting Radan as the first boss would usually be scary, but we have the Death's Poker, so it's an absolute joke.
jump back to Argyle Lake and up the Spirit Spring to grab the Starlight Shards. Then do the same at the Castle Morn Rampart Brace. Then north from the Highway Junction to drop down and grab the Amber Starlight. Now to Karia Manor. Bully the Retta with the Death's Poker, drop into the ruins to check out Celibus's creepy puppet dungeon, then speak to Rani and the boys, then Celibus to get the potion. Now you have a choice. If you want to fight Margit and Godric with the Wing of Astol, you can, but you'll miss out on the magic scorpion charm. And as it's really useful for this build, and they're going to get destroyed either way, I drop back to Stormvale to kill them at this point. Doing so with this weapon requires no explanation. Back to the round table to grab the talisman pouch. Give Gideon the potion, then back to Celebus to exhaust all of his dialogue reload the area four times by quitting out and grabbing the magic scorpion charm. Now down into Nokron, you'll get a somber five on the bridge, then all the way down to the night sacred ground for the finger slayer blade. Back to the walking mausoleum in Weeping Peninsula to duplicate Ridan's remembrance then into the Karian study hall and all the way to the top for the Int Talisman. Speak to Rani to unlock Renna's Rise and the path to the Wing of Astol. Now, if you're on PC, you can actually skip pretty much this entire setup by using the zip glitch to yeet yourself straight into Renna's Rise. You'd only have to kill Loretta for this. Through the teleporter into Ainzel past Baby Astol and take a left until you get to this guy who thinks he's in original patch Cyberpunk. Hide behind this pillar to avoid the meteorites, then grab the wing of Astol from the chest. Now since Noxtella is open to us, we may as well grab some upgrade materials. So head up the stairs, past the blobs, to get a somber seven from the chest in this room. Then a somber six from the scarab on the bridge further along. Back to Stormvale, across the courtyard, and into the room with the grafted sign. Take the right through the Stone Sword key gate and grab the Misery Port. Buy all the smithing stones you need, then head to EG to level the Misery Port to plus 16 and the Wing of Astol to plus 9. The next bit of our build is behind Red Wall. So after a very long setup, watch this. Run out of the debate parlor and left up the stairs to grab the glintstone wet blade. This allows us to give the misericord a cold infusion. Reload the round table hold a couple of times so that Roger dies, leaving his rapier behind. The rapier gives us the Ash of War glintstone phalanx, which does really good posture damage. So paired with Nebula on the wing, this is going to be truly ferocious. Equip this to the Misericord with a cold infusion. On this run, I also tried out the Glintstone and Karian Phalanx Sorceries with the Meteorite style. But the Ash of War is way better for actually breaking posture. But it's cool for the style points and works if you want to use some other sorceries too. So here's our build. Wing of Astol for big posture damage. The Misericord to swap to for big critical hits and casting glint blade phalanx. We have the dagger to buff with golden vow and the buckler for parries. So let's test the theory. Golden vow and phalanx to start. The glint blades build up posture damage while you use nebula for massive AR 
and big posture damage. When he staggers, swap the right hand to the Misericord for that big critical, then back to Nebula. So the reason we came to Noble is for the Dagger Talisman. So run through the rest of the dungeon, through the Stone Sword Key Gate, and jump down to go grab it. Now for the Draconic Outside Lane Dell. Start with Glint Blade, hit him with two Nebulas for the Stagger, then another two, one dodge, and finish with the Wing of Astol's seriously cool charged R2. into Langdale to bully the tree avatar, very deliberately ducking his swipe with that casting animation. Very deliberately, totally meant to do it. Now for Godfrey, and while R1s are the sensible approach, I wanted to break his stance for a riposte. And yeah, Nebula being Nebula again, meant that he was pretty much dead by the time his stance broke. Now obviously I could steamroll Morgoth with Nebula, but where's the fun in that? So to showcase the other side of this build, I jumped off the Saints Bridge and into my favourite cave in the my favourite cave in the game to bully the golem for the blue dancer charm. Then into the Lux ruins to bully the demi-human queen for the ritual sword talisman. And back to Rani's rise to drop down and grab Pidia's bell bearing for Karian retaliation. If you're wondering why I seem to have every bell bearing in the game unlocked, more on that later. So the other way of playing this build is the traditional way. Get naked, blue dancer charm, buckler, misericord. And yeah, even though this build isn't fully optimized for the misericord, this was an absolute massacre and by far the strongest parry build I've made in Elden Ring. Ride through the Zamor ruins and down into the cellar for the Smithing Stone Bell 3. Then to the Freezing Lake Grace to bait this golem into attacking the rock for the Smithing Sevens. Then around the lake to the first Church of Marika for the other Smithing Sevens on the cliff nearby. Head back to the round table to level the Misericord to plus 20. Pick up the Smithing 10 in the Big Skull and then into Fire Giant. And I'm just gonna let this one play. Run through Farum all the way to the Dragon Temple Transept Grace. And if you were expecting to see a parry fight with these two, just go and watch my randomizer video. I'm done with these nerds for a while after that. Pick up the Somber 10 from behind the dragon to level both of our weapons to max. Now for Alexander Shard. Speak to our dear pop friend in Radan's arena, then speak to him again 
in Mount Gilmere. Then do a little sparring with... All right, okay. While I was trying to get all of my mods set up and working with patch 1.10, it turns out I accidentally hit something that killed every NPC in the game. I'm sure he would have told me about his retirement plans to Medulla. Now for Beast and Malachi. We don't need to worry about Golden Val here, so you can take your time. Wait for the rock throw or the dragging sweep for safe nebula costs. And for Malika? For Godfrey, you could easily brute force this with Nebula, but as usual, I wanted to go for the style points on Horror Loop, so I went with a standard melee approach for Phase 1. For style points on Radagon, parry him three times with two R1s in between, then take the big repast. When he jumps, switch to the wing and cast two nebulas as he lands. From here, he's all but dead. Beast, it's very bad news. Despite the massive crit damage from the Misery Cores, because our build isn't intelligence optimized for Nebula, the Elden Beast fight is going to be a real struggle here. And by a struggle, I mean we'll have to hit him with one extra attack after the start of the fight. How Flame of the Red Mains got nerfed and Nebula didn't is beyond me. While we're in the mood for bullying big things, head back to Farum for Plassey. Now you'll notice here that I'm using the Glint Blade spell rather than the Ash. This is because this fight actually plays out a lot better if you don't stagger him as early as possible on this build. Because him being locked in that lightning animation allows us an extra nebula before the stagger. When you get the stagger, cast nebula on the head, then take the repost. After this, one more opening is all you need.
now to Castle Sol for Commander Nile. Take out the summons with Nebula and switch to your parry build. And here is where I got what might be the biggest AR I've ever done in a single attack in Elden Ring. Five thousand damage from a dagger repost on the build that isn't fully optimized for this misericord. For reference, the biggest hit I got on my Royal Knights Resolve Giant Crusher build with 80 strength was 4,400. I guess the next logical step here is a fully optimized Dex in parry build with Royal Knights Resolve. Let me know if you guys want to see that. Head through the snowfield all the way to Ordner Town. Then ride southwest towards the teleporter. Jump onto this ledge to cheese the invader. Then head in to Mogwin's palace. Now because doing this fight with Nebula is a given, I thought I'd show you how good the Wing of Astor is if you just use it normally with its super cool R1 moveset and awesome charged R2s. Even with this, you can still stagger the very tanky mode way before phase two. If knee heal wasn't there, you could definitely get another at half health. But because it is, you can get in some cheeky nebulas to nullify knee heal and get a stagger straight afterwards. The Wing of Astal is one of my favorite weapons in Elden Ring and both times I've used it in guides now, I feel like I've shown far too much Nebula and not enough of the wing, but Nebula's just too strong to ignore. Theoretically, Halig Tree Loretta should be a problem with this build because of her magic resistance. But if you can get her backed up against the wall, this fight is pretty trivial. And finally, Melania. And of course, we're gonna do this properly. The critical damage of the Misericord combined with the Frost means that this is definitely the strongest parry setup I've used for her. The last time I made a parry build with the Misericord was the first time that I've ever beaten Melania on my first try in a run. So it's fitting that this became the second time I've done that.
And that's it, how to make an absolutely nutty critical damage build on current patch. If you try this one or my original parry build on patch 1.10, please let me know how you got on in the comments. If you've enjoyed this video, give it a like and subscribe to my channel for more Elden Ring build guides. As always, thanks for watching. See you soon.